Our American menu is really a blending of cultures. It's getting to the point where anything goes now. I would say the dishes that really exemplify American food to me right now on our menu would have to be our meatloaf. Maybe instead of doing a traditional potato, we might put a spinach nudie in some pickled ramps or something along those lines that's in season. You can pretty much try anything and people are not going to uniformly say no to it. I would have to say our uh, potato skin. Right now it's a uh, fried potato skin with duck confit and uh, uh, Parmesan uh, cheese foam. Foams don't do a whole lot for me. Pork and beans was how our, pork, our Porkopolis started. Pork and beans is Americana. Menu's like writing a love letter, okay? You need to seduce people. We want you to eat a carrot and taste that carrot and say, this carrot tastes more like a carrot than a carrot tastes like. Now it's gotten to the point where a lot of stuff is just plain stupid that chefs are doing. It's just plain stupid. If America is a cultural melting pot, so is its cuisine. In the melting pot of 21st century America, though, has the label of American fare that so many restaurants wear lost all meaning? In the lead-up to Restaurant Week in downtown Cincinnati, we had conversations with star Cincinnati chefs, Stephen Geddes of Local 127, Todd Kelly of Orchids, and the infamous Jimmy Gibson of his namesake, Jimmy G's. All of them are discussing their takes on American cuisine today and how it plays out on their menus. When I first started, uh, you know, we really developed the menu around the Midwest, and if you think of the Midwest of it being very meat and potatoes in the Corn Belt, um, that's what we did. We started off um, with that parameter, and we went in and started with basic dishes that uh, highlighted that meat and potatoes, but we put a modern interpretation of those basic dishes on our menu, and we used you know, the best ingredients and using modern techniques and maybe a little bit more of uh, current trends to elevate those dishes from a classic steak and potatoes to something uh, completely different. Because of my past in Cincinnati, I'm eternally tied to beef, okay? And America is still, we eat meat, you know, probably more probably more pork and hogs now than we do steak almost. I mean, it's getting there. But I also like to be challenged and challenge myself as far as my abilities in the kitchen. And you can't just, you can't do that with just beef and baked potatoes. When I got here, I found out there was a lot more going on that was tied to what my my connections were, especially with beer and wine. And, and I didn't even know it was called Porkopolis when I first moved out. And I had been studying you know, whole animal butchery and snout to tail cookery of, of whole pork and, and that's always been something of interest and so, uh, you know, I got here and it was just like, wow, you know, I want to study whole, whole pork cookery and I'm now in Porkopolis and so it's been pretty incredible. Gas is odorless, colorless, and tasteless, and everybody broils their steaks on gas. Why do something odorless, colorless, and tasteless? Wood, I mean, you know, probably the first piece of meat that was eaten by man was because of something on fire, okay? Like, not natural gas. It was wood, or there was a, you know, a fire in a, in a field, and some animal got caught up in it, and they're like, oh, let's try this. The farm to table, is, it's not just about the farm to table, it's also about a localized economy, working with local purveyors, um, and, and having a local sense of place with the food. Um, you know, you could, you could work with the local farmers and your food still not taste anything local depending on how you handle it. it it's, you know, that's what happens with all the food that's shipped all over the world. It, it doesn't taste local and some of it doesn't even taste local where it's cooked, depending on how it's handled. We don't want to be too modern and make things or manipulate things too much that they become unrecognizable in visual appeal and then also flavor. But then also we want to showcase that it's, you know, it's not your mom's cooking. And, uh, but we want to kind of have that thought process of that there's, uh, you know, there's a lot of similarities, but just in a very refined, uh, in a refined plate. Food should be seasoned all the way through the cooking process, start to finish. Start to finish, food should be seasoned. You don't put the stuff in at the beginning and let it go till it's done and take it off the stove and not do anything else to it. Our steaks, same way, from start all the way through to the finish till they hit the plate. The last bit of seasoning goes on our steaks when it's on the plate. You know, we're in the middle of uh, growing season, so our goal is to uh, get as much as we can and bring our, 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 
our loop in as tight to the restaurant as possible. So what we do is we have our own urban garden that we have about 12 raised beds that we're harvesting uh, all of our herbs from. We're getting a lot of our braising greens. We're starting to get tomatoes, cucumbers, peppers. Um, there'll be a variety of beans coming in uh, and a variety of other arugula and a rapini and just a variety of other crops that we have growing in our urban garden and over the Rhine. If I'm going to do a braised piece of meat, I want to develop as much flavor in the beginning and then once I have that meat cooked, and then maybe the finishing of the sauce will have a couple aromatics at the end that'll kind of help heighten, that will be dulled if we put them in in the beginning. So I think it really depends on the dish that we're trying to accomplish. If we're gonna be cooking a piece of fish, you know, it's just very simply salted, and, uh, and that's the only spice. We wanna highlight the flavor and the quality of the fish, not necessarily mask it with a ton of different flavor. We dry age our, all our beef on the premises, you know, we butcher here, I buy the best quality I can buy, not making much money on the steaks, you know, because you can't pass that prime cost along to a guest, that's why we have a prime strip and a choice strip, they're both dry aged the same way, both cooked the same way, seasoned the same way, but I, I'm not here to, to New York people, I'm not here to force them to spend a lot of money because that's just not my style either. Our dishes are our dishes because they're they're the pure ingredients. We, they tend to be a little lighter, so they're not as heavy. And we do still try to. I mean, because you know, at the end of the day, if we're getting rid of more, less, we're using less butter, we're using less spices, we're using less heaviness. So we like to, and especially during the summer, everything's lightening up. I mean, our porkopolis right now is on a little wax bean. And then, of course, we try to have all kinds of beautiful salads and greens and vegetarian dishes. And uh, we have seafood, you know, scallops and striped bass and. Uh, we'll have, you know, just smoked trout, and so we, we do have a variety of very light things, too. We want a balanced menu. The lobster salad, you know, uh, it really became something that, you know, in a restaurant like ours, you know, the luxurious, uh, you know, ingredient of lobster is a must, but we wanted to take a little bit of the pretension out of it, and so we decided to, you know, just chop it up and make a lobster salad, and originally it started off as like a take on almost like a lobster roll, uh, like you would have in New England when I was a kid growing up, you know, it was a staple every summer, and so we kind of started off with that basis and so then we decided as we were eating it that it needed another a couple other components it needed a crisp component and so we decided to utilize an egg that we poached and wrap in the brick dough and then fry it and the thought process with there was almost like a take on a beef tartare so if you had a, an egg on top of a beef tartare the egg yolk falls over and it kind of adds a level of fat and dimension to um, the sauce or the ingredients that are already in the beef so we took that same principles and did that with a lobster As trends evolve and as technology evolves, I think a lot of my, my thought process evolves as well. You know, there's certain dishes that I may have, you know, seasoned in a different manner, but when you, when you take that same dish and you say you salt the beef before you're going to braise it, it's, uh, you know, it's, it really helps with the flavor profile. But if you're going to put it in a bag and sous vide it, I wouldn't salt it as much because then you're going to actually be losing some of the moisture. So as technology and different methods and trends kind of change, I think everything kind of adapts and we're continually evolving our methods in uh, the way that we're doing things. The foundations of the restaurant are certainly based on how we source our ingredients and how we handle them. So, uh, you know, it's not going to turn into a taco joint overnight, uh, for sure. Uh, and we will always, we won't be ordering, you know, prefabbed uh, pork chops that are pre-cut ever, uh, because that's not, it's not the, the philosophy and drive of this restaurant. It's good for you to be, uh, to know what everybody else is doing. You watch them and don't make their mistakes. Or you watch them and get inspired. You know, you, it can work both ways but not rip anybody off, you know, you don't copy, but, uh, you know, what do what writers call that? That's plagiarism. Plagiarism.